Good morning, everybody. Hello. How are you? Welcome. Um, I am Sarah, I'm Sarah Rosen Mortel, and I have the great privilege of being the president of the Urban Institute, which is uh, one of the two homes of the Urban Brookings Tax Policy Center, about who's uh, hosting you today. I welcome you, and I welcome those of you who are online, live, and who tune in later to watch us. Um, let me encourage you, uh, whether you are in the room or with us virtually, uh, to join the conversation, both by using social media uh, with the hashtag live at urban, and people can find you and react to your comments. And also for those of you who are viewing online live and would like to join the conversation, we'll have a, a question area at a period of the discussion, and we encourage you to send your questions throughout the course of the program to events at urban.org, and we'll make sure they get to the moderator. Um, at Urban, we like to say our mission is to elevate the debate by providing evidence-based analysis across a wide range of issue areas. We try to help use the research and the insights from research to solve real-world problems, and the work is centered around finding ways to improve opportunity for those at the bottom of the income ladder and to make our public policies and practice more effective. In line with this mission, the Tax Policy Center not only produces rigorous, sophisticated, and independent analysis of current and long-term issues, but also has an important record of influencing timely policy discussions, including, as many of you know, the debates on the campaign trail. Uh, Brookings Urban come together in doing this work with models that we've built here at Urban and with policy expertise across both institutions and this work on presidential campaigns and uh, the major sort of national pr proposals about policy uh, is one of the most important. Uh, TPC's models uh, have long been well regarded and uh, strong, but there's been a very exciting development for us of late by strengthening our own capacity to look at the dynamic impacts of these models and by partnering, uh, as you'll hear about today. So we're excited to welcome you to the first presentation of a TPC analysis that explicitly quantifies macroeconomic effects. This is a new capacity for TPC. In past, its estimates had incorporated microeconomic behavioral responses, such as changes in tax reporting or capital gains realization. But now, TPC is working to expand conventional analysis by incorporating changes in the macroeconomy, such as changes in output, wages, interest rates, and inflation. In cooperation with Ken Smetters and the Penn Wharton budget model, we can now estimate the effects of major tax plans. We are excited about this collaboration with Kent and his team at Penn Wharton, and we're very thankful for their hard work on these estimates. I know that all of the TPC crowd, so I also expect our Penn Wharton colleagues have found the rush to get this done in time for the public debate. Uh, it's not always the case that the um, merits of the detailed policy proposals is top of mind in the headlines, but our analysis of tax policy gets an extraordinary amount of attention during campaigns, and it's really a remarkable moment for us to, as we like to say, elevate the debate when candidates have live proposals. And so I know it's been a huge labor to do things on time, and I thank and congratulate everyone on both sides involved. As many of you know, Donald Trump released uh, a brand new uh, information about his tax proposal yesterday. And as rapid response as we are, we also are committed to quality and ensuring that the analysis is well done. And accordingly, we will be providing fresh analysis of both candidates' plans soon and look forward to using these new capacities to do so. Today, we're going to discuss our findings on the House Republican tax plan, which was released in June of this year. Our estimates are based on traditional estimates using TPC's microsimulation model, together with economic projections that were made using two different approaches to dynamic scoring. First, TPC has estimated the short-term effects of the plan on the economy by evaluating its impact on aggregate demand. And second, the Penn Wharton budget model has estimated the effects using a state-of-the-art overlapping generations general equilibrium model, which I'll confess, I'm not sure I totally understand, that incorporates the behavior of forward-looking households. That is, households whose choices depend on both current and future levels of wages, interest rate, and government policies. 
And so I'm going to uh, introduce the folks who can really help explain to you the way they've done that work. Senior fellow Ben Page joined TPC in June. Uh, uh, there was a happy dance that was going on uh, in Len's office at that time. Previously, Ben uh, spent over 20 years at CBO concentrating on analyzing the economic effects of legislation. One of TPC's great strengths is our ability to predict how uh, the modelers uh, in government, when policy gets to the finish line, will score things. And often we're looking at things long before they get there. So to be able to have the back and forth between CBO and urban that has happened over the years uh, on modeling like this is a great, uh, a great strength and we're very, very happy to have been here. Ken Smetters is the Boatner Professor of Business and Economics at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. He has a long and distinguished record of research in a variety of areas related to public policy and also previously served as an economist at the Congressional Budget Office. So I'm going to turn it over to Urban's uh, own Howard Gleckman, who's a TPC senior fellow and editor of the TaxFox blog, and joined together with our partners at Brookings and Doug Holtzikin, who he will further introduce, I'm sure. Uh, they'll uh, uh, get us to the, to the nuts of the discussion. Let me just say again, thank you everyone for coming and for uh, celebrating in the way that WOGs celebrate these additional capacities. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sarah, uh, for the very nice introduction. And uh, thank you all for coming, especially given uh, uh, that we were overtaken by events and had to scale back our presentation a little bit. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to start off by just uh, making a few general comments about um, uh, about the dynamic scoring. Uh, and I wanted to start just by expanding on Sarah's remarks about uh, conventional scoring. So uh, the, the way that uh, uh, TPC, the Joint Committee on Taxation, uh, and most analysts have, have traditionally approached things is uh, I'm going to call conventional analysis that includes a, a lot of behavioral responses. So some people have called this uh, a static analysis, and that's really not correct. Uh, this type of analysis includes behavioral resp responses such as, oh, if you increase uh, taxes on soda, people might st stop buying as much soda, buy fruit juice, iced tea, or something instead. If you raise uh, capital gains tax, people might delay their realizations of capital gains. Uh, if you reduce tax rates, people might uh, report more of their income. So th all those types of behavioral responses uh, have been included in conventional analysis of, of tax policy. However, that conventional analysis assumes that macroeconomic variables, has generally assumed that macroeconomic variables such as output, uh, inflation, interest rates, uh, remain unchanged. And so uh, dynamic scoring, I, I, I kind of think of it as another step on the ladder. You can think of conventional analysis, uh, including more and more behavioral responses, uh, uh, and, and improving the analysis of those kind of micro behavioral responses, dynamic scoring takes another step and says, okay, we're gonna look at the ways that um, behavioral responses could change macroeconomic variables, could change overall taxable incomes, for example. Um, so why, why wouldn't we have taken this step uh, already? Why wouldn't we have done this in the past? Well, I think there are a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that this type of analysis is difficult, like the, the modeling is not trivial. And I think it's an area where there have been, uh, the state of the art has really advanced in, uh, over time. And so I think it's something that, uh, that we're better at uh, than we once were. Um, but also there's probably less of a consensus among economists, among analysts about these macro effects than there are kind of on the, on the micro level, the, the behavioral responses that conventional analysis uh, incorporates. Um, and our approach is, is to kind of look at the range of opinion uh, among economists and analysts and try and, you know, put ourselves somewhere near the center of that range of opinion. Um, and it, the thing is that even though these effects are uncertain and economists may disagree about them, in many cases we can be pretty sure that they're not zero. And if you exclude these macro effects, you're essentially assuming that those effects are zero. 
So despite the uncertainty, the, the uncertainty is one, uh, I think, element that uh, people have used to criticize dynamic scoring. Um, but I think dis despite that uncertainty, despite the range of opinions, uh, it, is a, it does have the potential to improve our policy analysis if we include these dynamic effects in our analysis. Um, and um, kind of in that same vein, our experience has been, my experience uh, at CBO and our experience with the models that we've uh, been using, uh, is that the dynamic effects on revenues tend to be relatively modest. That including dynamic scoring really isn't a total game changer. Uh, it's, it's not the, the huge impact that uh, some people might have hoped for and some people might have feared. Uh, so if you're looking at a tax plan that loses a lot of revenue according to conventional analysis, generally if you dynamically score that plan, it's, gonna it's still going to lose a lot of revenue. Um, one, one exception to that is that if you have plans that have large kind of gross changes in taxes, tax increases on one side, tax reductions on the other side, that might have a, a little net effect on revenues uh, conventionally scored and in the extreme if it's revenue neutral there's no effect, well then of course the dynamic effects can be uh, significant relative to those, those very low effects, but compared to the kind of gross effects uh, uh, in, the, in uh, the tax structure, they're still pretty modest. Um, dynamic scoring is, is uh, dynamic scoring or dynamic analysis is uh, important not only for uh, revenue projections, but also because those kind of macro effects may be of interest in themselves. So um, many um, tax policy proposals are, are sold on the basis of uh, what their economic effects are going to be. Uh, um, and, uh, and, it's, and it's one important feature or, or one important aspect of tax policy uh, that, that can contribute to, to our understanding of whether, whether a policy is desirable or not. Um, uh, so I think that, you know, uh, on the one hand, doing this type of dynamic analysis is a useful check on those kind of claims. Uh, if if uh, a claim is made for a tax policy that it's going to have uh, very large effects. If you have independent and kind of impartial analysis, uh, that's kind of a check on those claims, and, and that's important in, uh, in and of itself. But I, I don't want to oversell kind of the importance of the macro effects of tax policy. I think there are, I may be straying a little bit into personal opinion here, but there are other aspects that are really more fundamental in general to, um, to tax policy. And first and foremost, that's just the level of revenues that we want to raise. Uh, there's, a, there's a political decision, a policy decision that has to be made of how much revenue do we want and how many government services do we want to be able to provide. So do we want a, a world where we have a low level of uh, revenues, a low tax burden, and a relatively low level of government services? Or do we want a world, world where we have higher taxes, a higher tax burden, but also more services can be provided by the government. So that's, that's really a, a more fundamental to me uh, uh, aspect of tax policy. And the second is once you know how much revenue you want to raise, who exactly is going to pay it? How is that tax burden going to be distributed across households based on their income level, based on family structure? Uh, tax policy can have regional effects if it impacts different in industries, so there's a, a whole lot of questions about how a given tax burden will be uh, distributed across households. Um, and uh, the final point is uh, 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 connected a little bit to, to what I said before about dynamic scoring generally having fairly modest effects on revenues. Um, in the context of a whole, of a well-functioning economy like the United States, uh, tax policy really affects the economy mainly at the margins. Uh, uh, tinkering with the tax code. So, uh, for example, uh, uh, over the next 10 years, the, the economy is projected to grow about 20%. The following 10 years, another 20%. So, we're looking at, uh, you know, the estimates we're looking at today are looking at impacts on the economy on the order of a, of a percent. And that's, um, that's not nothing. Everyone would like to get a, a percent raise. Uh, but in the context of an economy that's growing, you know, 40% over the next two decades, 
it's, it's really kind of affecting things at the margins. And you know, getting uh, uh, fundamental things right uh, in, your, in, your, uh, in the way that the, the rule of law uh, uh, operates in a country, contracts are enforced, uh, um, uh, labor markets are well-functioning, uh, those kind of more f fundamental things uh, uh, are really uh, more basic to, to uh, how the economy is going to perform. So today we're going to uh, uh, present two approaches to dynamic analysis, and, and uh, Sarah alluded to this. I just wanted to say a, a few more words about it. Um, uh, first of all, we're going to uh, present a Keynesian analysis. This is a model that I've worked on since in, in the relatively short time that I've been here. Um, and this model, um, basically, the, its estimates are based on changes in aggregate demand. So uh, uh, essentially, it's built on the assumption that in the short run, output will adjust, will rise and fall to, uh, to uh, meet the level of demand in the economy. Uh, this model is based on relationships between aggregate variables, so looking at aggregate consumption, investment, output, uh, and mainly those relationships are based on how those economic aggregates have uh, behaved in the past, so uh, uh, essentially based on the historical, historical experience. Um, maybe most importantly, this model <coughs> at its base, it's trying to estimate changes in the economy relative to its potential or full employment level. So the idea is that uh, the potential of the economy is kind of determined by uh, uh, labor supply, capital, productivity, but in the, in the short run, uh, output can fluctuate up and down relative to that potential level as unemployment fluctuates up and down. People uh, uh, enter and leave em employment, um, and that's the type of short-run effect that this Keynesian model is looking at. And uh, by that same token, these fluctuations in output relative to potential are temporary. We, uh, uh, we assume that the economy returns to its long-run potential or full employment level over time. So the, the estimates that the Keynesian model is making um, only, only last for the first few years. Uh, and I'll just say a few words about uh, Kent's model. I, I'm sure he'll have more detailed explanation, but I just wanted to draw the contrast head to head uh, uh, before we got started. So he has this over, he runs this, I mean, very sophisticated state of the art overlapping generations model. It differs in that it's built up from the household level. So the model involves households that are making decisions about how much to work or save, and then the macroeconomic output, uh, uh, outputs are determined by adding up everything from the household level. Um, so it, it, it's, it's kind of bottom up rather than top down as the Keynesian model is. Uh, the households in the model respond to incentives to work and save, so a tax plan that reduces marginal tax rates on labor uh, will tend to increase uh, labor supply, make people uh, work more. Uh, 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 if it reduces uh, tax rates on uh, capital income, it can encourage people to save more. The households in the model, importantly, are forward-looking, so this allows the model to examine tax policies that are phased in over time, for example, or or aren't going to occur until some point in the future. Um, uh, so th that's an important, useful feature. <clears throat> and in this model, it's, it's a model where of the real economy, so output equals potential. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't have these kind of fluctuations of output relative to its potential level. And can, can recharacterize anything that I've gotten wrong. Um, OK, but to turn to the Keynesian model. So. Uh, the model, is, as we've constructed it, estimates uh, the effects on demand in two stages. You can, you can look at it as, as operating in two stages. First of all, there's a direct effect of the policy on demand. So you can think of, suppose a tax policy only changed income for one household. You gave a tax cut to one household. That household would have more income. They might change consumption. So what I'm calling the direct effect is just that change in consumption by that one household. Uh, similarly, you know, where the one business was given an investment incentive, the direct effect would be their change in investment. And then second, uh, those initial changes in demand uh, 
can ripple through the economy and have other effects on, on other households' consumption, on business investment, on interest rates. Um, and, and so uh, those are kind of the, the knock-on effects uh, that follow the, the initial effect, the initial direct effect on demand. Uh, the model employs a range of assumptions for both these direct and indirect uh, effects. So we end up with a, a range, a predicted range of effects on the economy and on revenues uh, to, affect, to, to reflect you know, the de large degree of uncertainty uh, that there is about uh, behavioral responses. And uh, these effects fade over four years, as I said. These are effects on the economy relative to potential. So over a period of years, we assume that the economy uh, goes back to its potential level. Um, okay, so how do we estimate the direct effect on demand of a tax policy? Well, uh, the most basic effect is on household consumption. So if a, a, uh, a tax policy cuts taxes on households, then their after-tax income rises. Household income rises, we assume that some of that extra income will be spent. Um, and when you add that up, you get an aggregate effect on, on spending. Uh, there's a pretty large uh, uh, line of research that shows that lower income households tend to change their spending uh, in response to a change in income by more than do higher income households. Uh, and this could be a, for a variety of reasons, but what, one of the common explanations is that there's a large set of households that are what we call liquidity constrained, which means they would, they're, given their situation, they'd like to borrow against future income to increase their current consumption. Uh, they're not, they don't have access to capital markets to do that, so they're kind of uh, stuck at their income level. They'd really like to spend more than their income, therefore when their income rises or falls, their consumption falls, rises and falls more or less along with it. Uh, so uh, the, the assumptions that are incorporated in the Keynesian model uh, we assume that the lowest quintile of, of households, the lowest income quintile of households, spends 90 cents out of every dollar of change in income. Uh, and the richest households spend 55 cents out of every uh, additional dollar in spending. Then we uh, combine these uh, assumed uh, uh, household responses with the distributional effects that are estimated by TPC's micro simulation model. It, it can estimate the, the change in after-tax incomes at different income levels and uh, just multiply those income levels by the assumed uh, responses in the model uh, and that leads to uh, the change in consumer demand. Also, uh, another effect that tax policy can have is if it changes uh, the incentive for firms to invest. So uh, in an, an example of that is allowing firms to immediately write off uh, the cost of investments against their profits rather than only being able to do that over time according to a depreciation schedule. Uh, this creates a, a marginal incentive for the, the firms to invest um, and thereby increases investment spending. And this, um, uh, uh, the response to these incentives in the, in the Keynesian model is based largely on research of past instances of, of expensing, which is complicated because uh, the details are always different and there uh, uh, are differences in, in how long those uh, uh, measures were supposed to last and what capital they were applied to, but kind of adjusted for those differences and, and for kind of the magnitude of the plan, that's, that's that line of research is where our estimates uh, came from. And finally, in addition to um, the impact on after-tax incomes, policies may change the value of, of wealth holdings of households, uh, uh, things like stock prices, and that also can lead consumers to change their consumer spending. So indirect effects. So these direct effects on consumer spending and investment spending uh, as I say, ripple said before, ripple through the economy and create further effects. Uh, that and those further effects can either add to or offset the um, original direct effect. So on the plus side, uh, uh, 
uh, things that can enhance the or enhance the effect of the the direct effect. Um, when someone spends a dollar, that's a dollar of income to someone else. So. Uh, when you assume that the consumer spending is rising, you have to say, well, what's happening to the, that money once, once someone else receives it? Uh, their behavior may change. They may raise consumption, or if it's a business whose profits go up, they may increase investment. Um, if it's a business that needs to gear up production to, to um, uh, meet the increased demand, they may increase hiring, and then therefore those newly hired people have additional salaries that would increase more demand. So those are all uh, uh, factors that might increase the, the original effect on demand. On the other hand, um, increased demand could uh, lead to pressure on prices uh, and could lead the Fed to respond by raising interest rates. Uh, those higher interest rates then would, would discourage investment by businesses because the, the cost of capital would rise, the cost of borrowing would rise. Um, and could and discourage uh, consumer spending on durables like like automobiles. Uh, and another factor could be if they're kind of supply bottlenecks. So if you increase demand in one area, you draw you might draw activity away from other areas that that you know uh, uh, specialized uh, uh, workers with specialized skills, specialized machinery, and that could offset. You could have falls in output in other areas of the economy when you have increases in one area. So those are, um, those are aspects that, uh, indirect effects that might offset the original direct effects on demand. Uh, the um, magnitude of these indirect effects is, um, depends importantly on how the Federal Reserve responds to them. Uh, in normal economic times, uh, the Fed will respond to expansionary tax policy, policy that increases demand by raising interest rates to uh, avoid an increase in inflation. So the idea is that if, if uh, there's expansionary tax policy that increases consumer spending, lowers the unemployment rate, you could start to see increases in wages, increases in prices. The Fed would offset that by increasing interest rates um, uh, and thereby reducing the, creating a kind of a negative indirect effect. Uh, by contrast, in a deep recession or, or you know, the situation we've been in for, for much of the past uh, uh, six years, uh, six or seven years, is that um, uh, the economic uh, situation is so bad that the Fed will not change rates in, in response to fiscal policy, that they've set interest rates already about as low as they can go, and so um, any additional demand for f uh, on the fiscal side uh, from, from tax policy or, or from whatever else will not generate a response from the Fed. And this was one of the um, uncertain aspects uh, of the analysis, I'll admit, because we're kind of in a little bit in another world right now. Uh, the Fed has raised interest rates from above zero, but it's kind of stuck very close to zero. So uh, our assumption was that uh, the Fed was going to respond in kind of a mix of these two, two uh, ways in 2017 that given economic conditions, the Fed would respond to expansionary fiscal policy, fiscal policy to, uh, like a, a tax cut by increasing interest rates, but not by much as they would in normal times. And in later years, though, we, uh, we assumed that the economy would kind of be back to normal, the Fed would be back to its normal uh, behavior. And that mixed kind of uh, mixed policy uh, uh, what it adds up to is that in 2017, we assume that uh, indirect effects offset about a sixth of the direct effects on demand, and in later years, they offset a half of, of the, ef the effect. So that means that uh, in 2017, for every dollar increase in demand, there's about an 80 cent impact on output, whereas in later years, for every dollar impact on demand, there's about a 50 cent increase in output. Uh, okay, so to get to our uh, specific analysis, the House GOP tax plan. So um, the House GOP tax plan includes a, a host of changes in tax rates, uh, uh, in deductions, in business taxation. Uh, we ha we've released this morning a, a review of the tax plan and exactly uh, our assumptions in analyzing it in detail, so I encourage everyone to take a, a look at that document. 
Uh, for the purposes of the Keynesian model, though, there are really just uh, two main aspects uh, uh, of the plan that are important. First, uh, it cuts taxes for most households. So most households will see an increase in after would see an increase in after-tax income if that policy was implemented. Um, and with those higher incomes, we assume that households would spend more. Um, the, the distributional analysis of the plan indicates that, that the, most of the, the greatest proportion of the dollar cuts will go to relatively higher income households under this plan. And um, as, I, as I said before, we assume that those households uh, alter consumption by less than would uh, lower income households. So that uh, mutes the, the impact on dem demand a, a bit. Uh, the second main uh, uh, feature of the plan uh, from the point of view of the Keynesian model is that they allow uh, full expensing of investment spending by firms. Uh, they allow the, the cost of investment to be written off uh, against the, the taxable business income. And uh, that encourages firms to boost investment spending. Um, uh, and uh, as I said, uh, our, our estimates of the effect of the specific plan in the in the specific provision, expensing provision in the GOP tax plan, uh, were based on past uh, instances, analysis of past instances of of expensing plans, together with uh, um, those those were uh, uh, research on kind of at the micro level on how firms responded. Um, there's also a strand of research on how the economy as a whole responds uh, that entered that calculation as well. So if you put all this together, the, the effects on um, uh, the direct effects uh, on demand that, that I've just talked to and how those uh, flow through the economy, uh, uh, create a little bit of an in increase in interest rates, which offsets some of the effect. Uh, what, do we end up, what do we end up with uh, as our estimated effects? And I so uh, as I get to these, I'll just want to re reiterate that in a way, this is kind of a part of the story that I'm uh, uh, presenting here. So these are these demand effects that are uh, changing the economy relative to potential. There's, on the other side, there are changes in potential output, and Kent's going to talk about uh, some of those. But also, we are, we're actively uh, uh, creating a capacity uh, to do our own analysis of potential that then could be uh, uh, integrated with this uh, uh, demand analysis. And that's something that, you know, uh, uh, we're working on, we hope to do in the future. Uh, for now, I'm kind of showing this, this one side of the, of the story. Okay, so uh, what, what effects do we estimate? So the, the blue bars here are kind of our base estimates. Uh, for the percentage impact on GDP in each calendar year. And uh, we estimate about a 1.4% uh, positive impact in 2017, a boost of about 0.4% in 2018, and then smaller amounts as that fades away over time. Uh, as I said, we have a, a, a range of estimates. That range includes a range in the amount that um, uh, households are assumed to spend out of each additional dollar of after-tax income. It includes a range on the uh, effect of the expensing provision on investment by firms, and it includes a, a range on the possible uh, indirect effects, uh, how much of the, the um, initial effect on demand will be offset by indirect effects. So under that full range of assumptions, the impact on, on GDP in 2017 could range from about 0.3 to 3.1%. Uh, in 2018, from 0.1 to 1%, and smaller amounts in later years. Uh, those effects on output, in turn, impact would impact revenues. There's increased output that increases taxable incomes, so that would increase output. Now, this slide I should uh, make sure this is just the extra impact of the economic effects on revenues. So in 2017, for example, we estimate that the dynamic effects would increase revenues by about $43 billion. 
So what that means, since the tax plan as a whole reduces revenues substantially, uh, that, that means that uh, that reduction in revenues would be, would be smaller by $42 billion uh, uh, in 2017. Uh, similarly, in 2018, our base estimate is a dynamic effect of, of $29 billion, lower amounts in years after that. Uh, once again, the, the range of estimates that we have for GDP imply, similarly imply a, a range for the impact on revenues. Uh, we estimate that in 2017, that could range from 12 billion to 97 billion, 2018 from four to 64 billion, and by smaller amounts in later years. So what does that mean in the context of our overall estimates? So uh, this diagram shows the, uh, uh, the macro effects alongside the um, estimated, uh, the effects estimated conventionally. So that the top of all these bars with everything added together, that's the impact, that's the revenue loss. I'm showing it as a positive number, but that's the revenue loss as conventionally estimated. So in the, in the first year, uh, that was estimated to be about $246 billion. And uh, that's the same under any, any of the dynamic uh, assumptions, so that's why all those bars are the same height. Uh, the little red bar at the top, that's the dynamic effect on revenues. So there's an extra uh, 46 billion from, 43 billion from uh, the dynamic effects. So the, the revenue loss after taking account of dynamics is the height of the blue bar. So there, here, here you can see um, kind of the, uh, I, I would reiterate my, my initial point that these dynamic effects typically, as we have estimated them, as I've estimated them in the past, um, aren't total game changers. You can see there's a definitely offsets, uh, if you incorporate dynamic effects, it offsets a chunk of the conventionally estimated revenue loss, but it's, it's, you know, it's, a, it's a relatively modest share. Uh, and as these effects fade over time because of the, the nature of the Keynesian model, that proportion gets smaller and smaller over time. Um, so I, I, I guess I would just reiterate that you know, we're, we're um, very excited about introducing this, this dynamic element to TPC's uh, estimates. Uh, I think it does, um, it does have the potential to improve the debate and to uh, improve uh, analysis uh, of policy proposals, but uh, we don't anticipate it to be just a dramatic, game-changing uh, alteration in, in how we estimate uh, revenue effects. With that, I'll turn it over to my friend Ken. Thank you. That was uh, great, Ben. And um, I'm going to uh, talk about the Penn Wharton budget model now. To first say, it's been a real pleasure to work with uh, the Tax Policy Center. A lot, a lot of very smart people here, and it's, it's been a lot of fun. Um, so let me address the first question, and simply it's why is Wharton involved in this? And it's really part of Wharton's um, uh, main mission to essentially use big data, analytics, advances in cloud computing, all those types of things to address big questions. And we've been doing that for private sector type of analysis, healthcare, finance, and so forth for, for you know, s several years now. But uh, it's really the belief that public policy should also be informed by these uh, uh, newer uh, uh, methods. And so, <clears throat> uh, hopefully, here we go. Um, so what we're doing with this uh, uh, model is that we um, have developed a microSIM kind of static model and uh, that has a lot of heterogeneity and richness and so forth. There's a white paper on our, our website that talks about that. And then we've built a dynamic model that kind of layers on top of that, which is a stochastic overlapping generations 
uh, uh, model. And the, that model produces what's called deltas that we can layer on top of the rather rich microsimulation model in order to get these macro effects. So we kind of get this best of both worlds. And then we've created a large data uh, warehouse that uh, allows us for calibration. And then I'll show you a bunch of results. I'll actually show them live from the website. And you'll see that it looks like, wow, I'm getting instant feedback. Um, and in reality, these models can take you know several hours or several days to run. And what we do is that we uh, use cloud computing to, in fact, pre-compute every single combination. So you can actually play with different assumptions and um, see, see the impact. And so we, for this ex uh, exercise, we've integrated with the Tax Policy Center model, their microSIM model. What we're pulling from our microSIM model are things uh, are more on the outlay side so that we can add up um, given their, their revenue estimates, we can add up things like uh, government debt and so forth. And as Ben pointed out, in our model, we start bottom up. Uh, households are making decisions and about how much to work, how much to save, um, and when to retire. And they do that in the context of uncertainty. They face un their, uh, uncertainty about their own wages. They don't know exactly when they're, gonna, when, when they're going to die. And then labor and capital markets are the ones that determine prices as we aggregate up. They're the ones that fix, determine uh, what's the wage rate given the supply and demand of labor, and same thing with capital. And the model does include um, some, there's a big philosophical debate, you know, whether we mean by Keynesian versus non-Keynesian, and output versus potential, and so forth. I mean, uh, you know, the one class of school says there's uh, output it is potential by definition, if, uh, but nonetheless, um, there's a, uh, we won't, we'll sidestep that. And I'll put Keynesian in quotes in the sense that we, we have in the model um, a lot of households that are what we call borrowing constrained. It's either because Social Security has reduced their need for saving. Uh, half of households uh, will, will depend on Social Security as their primary um, uh, retirement income, so they don't need to save very much. Or they f face various negative shocks to like their wages, to the health care expenses, things like that. And so they're borrowing constrained. And as Ben pointed out, when you give those guys money, um, as something that's more of a broad-based tax cut, it's going to be more stimulating in our model in the short run, increase consumption more, because you're giving these higher marginal propensity non-savers, kind of hand-to-mouth consumers, more money um, relative to something that's more targeted uh, to people with, with assets. And then we do with some other things. There's a fixed cost of labor supply, um, a, a kind of a Keynesian element. And we also do check, it actually didn't turn out not to matter for this runs, if in fact real wages ever grow um, slower than inflation, that is nominal wage rigidity, and it turned out not to matter. Uh, for this point. Um, the, what we did is, you know, I'm, I'm an academic, I've done a lot of these academic models, and I'll be the first to admit, <laughs> even models I've written in the past really are not realistic for thinking about actual policy proposals. And in particular, past models um, uh, have included a lot of work I've done, is uh, comparing different tax regimes on a revenue neutral basis. And that's just not very plausible when we actually think about candidate plans, in particular, where they're not revenue uh, a, a, a neutral. And so we have to deal with that and allow for the debt to, in fact, change during the model um, endogenously. And then the question is, how do we stop the model from blowing up if the debt keeps accumulating? What we do is by the year 2040, we say whatever the debt GDP ratio is at that point, um, it's sometimes called the closure rule. Whatever it is at that point, it's not necessarily the baseline. It could actually be with a, a much higher level given the policy or a much lower level given the policy. But whatever is at that point, then we assume magic happens. And in particular, a, 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 cu a cut in government spending to keep the debt output ratio constant because otherwise the economy could, could, uh, could potentially uh, blow up. And so, so in some ways, this is a gift to plans that actually create more debt. 
but we really push off this closure rule pretty far to, to really uh, get the dynamic effects of debt. And then we also allow for more rich uh, uh, international capital flows um, uh, it, uh, rather than just taking two extremes of a closed economy, a uh, small open economy. And we spent a lot of time really thinking about how to model the hybrid tax system of the United States. We're not residential. We're not completely territorial. It's a hybrid. And so we have a pass-through amounts of, of capital income that estimate we get from the TPC. And that uh, is, is, is part of personal income taxes. And then um, uh, and that's obviously a residential tax treatment. And then corporations are, are modeled more as a territorial tax. And so therefore, after you, in fact, uh, do reform, you're equalized in the after-tax returns across borders. OK. And then we calibrate to lots of different data sets. I'm always, uh, uh, many, you may not care about the data sets that we use, but I'm always asked. So I thought I'd tell you. We, we use lots of the conventional uh, data sets to calibrate um, the model. So let me actually go to the website, kind of live, and you can do this on your own. It's live right now. Um, and it's, it's, uh, uh, it's simply uh, budget model uh, dot, here, let me see if this is uh, working here. We tested this out beforehand. Hopefully this, eh. AV person, oh, let's see the rescue. All right, it's not working. I can't get to, this is not, the wireless is not working here. But I have backup slides just in case the wireless, it was on and off earlier today. But so yeah, I can't get to the website from here. All right, so I'll go with the backup slides. I'm sorry. Uh, there we go. <laughs> it's magically happening in the back room. Um, or maybe it's on the clapper system. Okay. So, <laughs> now let me see. I don't think my mouse is actually working, however, back there. So I'm not able to. So just go back, uh, go back to my slide deck because then the mouse is not working uh, anyway. Thank you. It's, this is fine. So let's just go through it but then in order. In particular, uh, it, it, if, so there's this, uh, what you'll see on the website is that we have these different uh, controls that you can um, assume. So normally, so we've already launched modules on Social Security and immigration, things like that. And those modules, what the Dow controls that we gave you were policy controls. And in particular, you could change the tax max on Social Security, you could change benefits, uh, change retirement date, things like that. And what we haven't exposed there, which we will soon, is the actual economic assumptions, demographic assumptions, and so forth. Those are a little less controversial. We kind of generally agree on the uh, uh, retiree worker age ratio in 2030, things like that. What we've really exposed is the policy. For tax reform, it's just the opposite. We've taken the, uh, the candidate plans or House GOP plans. That defines the policy. And we're focusing now on kind of the assumptions that we've always debated about for many years. And so when I was at CBL years ago, I remember fierce debates, well, not uh, you know, internally necessarily, but just in the academic world that we're trying to summarize between things like labor supply elasticity, savings elasticity. Those were the big uh, points of discussion. In fact, I see someone from CBO here who wrote a great labor supply elasticity summary literature about that um, some years ago. And it actually turns out those elasticities matter a lot when you're talking about revenue neutral plans. Those parameters, they still matter with unbalanced plans that are not revenue neutral. But what really matters much more is, in fact, uh, the rate of foreign investment flows. That dominates kind of everything. So you have these dial controls that you can actually move uh, different elasticities, uh, different foreign rate of investments. You can change federal outlays, things like that. And uh, the f uh, first one is that if we think about for foreign investment flows at like 0%, that would correspond to our classic closed economy model. New debt is all purchased by domestic people. 100% would be your small open economy kind of classic model. That would be a little unrealistic too. That's a kind of assuming like the United States is a banana republic in a very small com country. 100% of the new debt would essentially be bought by, by foreigners. We actually think 40% is a more plausible number. I'll, I'll try to justify that later. But let's talk about some extremes first. 
Suppose that we take this, the open economy model. So I've just done this in front of you and pretend like I just moved that dial over <laughs> to 100%, which I was uh, uh, originally hoping to do, but it's an, no big deal. So suppose we do 100%. And then we have what's uh, pull-down menus of different things that you can look at, GDP, capital services, labor, a bunch of other, you know, different things. And then revenue stuff, debt, deficits, um, revenues, and so forth. And so if, in fact, you believe that the United States is this kind of small, open economy, so very rich amounts of capital flows internationally, then the House GOP plan is, is in fact, quite stimulating in, in terms of output. And in particular, by, within just 10 years, we're assuming the reform start in 2017, with the, by 2027, uh, GDP is up about 2.5%. And the reason why is that, we'll see in just a second, debt doesn't really matter so much in this model because uh, we know that debt c competes for, for s household saving, uh, but in a small open economy model, foreign capital is c rushing in and taking care of all that um, because we're equalizing the after-tax rates on a territorial basis. And so you, we can see revenues now. The black line is kind of the baseline amount of revenue. Um, and the red line, the bold red line, is the static revenue um, uh, uh, projection. And in particular, this is how it would be kind of conventionally uh, uh, scored. And then the dotted line is showing the dynamic revenues. And so the tax plan clearly loses some revenue, but the, you also get this positive dynamic score just given by this wedge right here, the difference between the dotted red line and the solid red line, that is some, some money that you're making back because the economy is growing and so forth. Um, and so now let's take the opposite extreme. Let's consider a closed economy. So the closed economy, again, that's an extreme too. We don't believe that either. This is saying no capital flows. And so you, GDP effects are, are quite different. You get this small bump in the short run, right here, uh, on a dynamic effect. And what's happening there is these borrowing constrained kind of consumers, you're giving them some money. There's some changes on the personal income tax side. You're getting some stimulus kind of there. But it's also true a lot of the, the taxes are not focused on, on them. So it's, it's a pretty small effect. But then over time, notice that the, the, the dynamic line actually falls below the static uh, projection. By, by the way, the red line being a static projection, by definition, as Ben was pointed out earlier, that's the same thing as the baseline. That's, that's a line with no economic feedback effects. That would be like under current policy for, for GDP. And so uh, we now have GDP that's now falling below the static estimate, which is also equal to the pre-policy baseline uh, 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 growth in GDP. And, uh, and what's happening here is that now notice with revenues, we look at the revenue side, we get a small positive dynamic score, very small in the short run, and over time the dynamic score actually goes negative. The tax cut uh, leads to a negative dynamic score rather than the, the, the traditional positive dynamic score. What's driving this? And that's simply debt held by the public. In a closed economy, this uh, plan is not balanced, so the debt held by the public is increasing, and it's competing with uh, uh, private capital for household saving. And so household savings is just not going to increase enough to absorb all the new debt. It has to, the entire amount of uh, uh, saving available for, for private capital is going to uh, uh, go down. And so as a result of that, in a closed economy, what we see is GDP by the 10th year, 2027, actually goes down by a quarter of 1%. Again, when the open economy is up by 2.5%, and the closed economy goes down slightly uh, by the 10th year by, by just one quarter of 1%. Okay, and so, and it's really driven by this debt analysis, which is really important to uh, uh, consider um, because this is a primary uh, uh, driver. In fact, this, it, it, you can change the different elasticities. They work in the right direction, what you expect. This, by far, is the, is the big one. And so we think a baseline economy of about 40% is about right. The idea of, roughly speaking, somewhat loose, but um, is that 40% of new debt 
issued by the government would be bought by, by foreigners. In other words, or alternatively, you could think of, you know, 100% is uh, being our open economy, 0% uh, uh, being our closed economy. This is kind of 40% of the results from the open economy, 60% of the results from the closed economy. And so what we see, um, uh, what we think is a, a plausible, and by the way, if you go to our website, which is simply budgetmodel.wharton.upenn.edu, we have a whole issue brief that's connected to the simulator that really tries to go into great detail, tries to justify the ranges of elasticities, why we think is a reasonable baselines, and so forth. Under the 40% scenario, notice that GDP, in fact, goes up in the short run, and in fact, by 2027, it's about a 0.9%, close to 1% increase in GDP under the Ryan plan. But then over time, this debt accumulation is starting to kick in. And we actually are seeing, um, uh, as a result, GDP falling below uh, the static score, which again, by definition, is the, the, the current law baseline over uh, a longer period of time. And uh, so by far, the, the most important sentence is foreign investment. So why do we come up with 40%? Again, you can play with the different elasticities. They work in the right directions, what you expect. But this is the big one. So why 40%? Well, there's a couple ways of kind of looking at that. First, there's no question we're not in a closed economy. That would just be unrealistic. Uh, for example, this graph, this is loose, but this shows the domestic national saving rate going down over time. And what's been going up over time is net capital inflow raise. I mean, it does seem like we do see responses internationally to changes in domestic saving. You can pick on this graph. It's not controlling for a lot of things. I agree. But for most economists would really concur we have a pretty robust capital flows, especially in uh, treasury markets. Uh, but if you actually look at uh, new treasury issuance, about 40% of it is bought by foreigners. Now, it is true. You could say, well, you know, there's a difference between levels and deltas, and, you know, levels and margins and things like that. But, uh, uh, but this is a, a, a fair, uh, this itself is described as a delta. About 40% of new issuance is bought by, by foreigners. Um, but that's probably actually an upper bound. In particular, if you look beyond government debt, because the assumption of 40%, that's not true just for government debt. That's actually supposed to be true in, in the model for all, you know, saving. So if anything, uh, because there's a no arbitrage condition between, between the two. And so, in fact, uh, we would expect fairly on our 40% setting, uh, you know, 40%-ish capital flow. It's not just for debt, but for all capital. Um, but if you actually broaden the definition of capital beyond just treasury debt. Treasury debt is very ubiquitous. It's held by Japanese insurance companies. It's, you know, it's well known throughout the world. But other securities in the United States are not nearly as traded. And this is the classic home bias puzzle that Felsen and Horioka came up with years ago. Um, they talk about legal structures, investing in what you know, your home economy, things like that. Um, this, that's the Felsen and Horioka results have been revisited with Absel Rogoff. But even today, and that's still a dated study, but most studies show that it's still very much there. But even today, if you just look at foreign entities, they only hold about 18.5% of all securities that are being issued in the United States, but, or whether by government, private companies, when we're talking about uh, stocks and bonds. So we think our 40%, if anything, is maybe a little bit on the generous side, uh, if anything. Um, and but also keep in mind, if there's no free lunch here, if you believe there's robust capital flows, it's not coming for free. I mean, it's, you're selling off more of your domestic capital stock to foreigners as a, as a, as a cost of doing that. And so you're getting some GDP, but at, at the cost of selling to foreigners. So let me just, just uh, give, we don't give policy <laughs> recommendations at Penn Wharton Budget Model. I think that's also true at, at TPC. Let me, however, give an academic-ish <laughs> insight, because I think this is a, an important point, as uh, I'm sure this plan and many other plans are being designed and redesigned going in, in the future. A lot of focus on these plans have been on uh, recently on business investment. And there's no question business investment is down in the United States. 
Um, and it's also no question that the U.S. corporate statutory rate, the statutory rate, um, is very high relative to developed countries or higher than developed countries. And so the House GOP plan, the, my reading of it is that it tries to do kind of doubly encourage business investment by doing two things. One is it increases expensing, and the second is it's reducing the capital income tax, the corporate tax rate, at the same time. And so expensing is this bonus depreciation idea. What I don't think is well being understood is that these two things are actually working in the opposite direction in a model like this. And let me explain this. And then I, I, I was not supposed to show any math equations, but I'll show one, because that's actually kind of important. How does expensing work? Expensing is a very, uh, generally agreed upon by economists across the spectrum, Ex expensing is a very powerful mechanism for encouraging new investments because it distinguishes between existing capital and new capital. It only gets rewarded for new in investment. And so expensing says, in fact, you get to write off your capital investments today. You don't have to wait for the kind of the natural rate of depreciation. And so at the margin in an economy without rents, you're not paying the taxes and present value on new, on, on new capital. Um, now, it's, it is also true that if you have an economy with rents, um, things, the Googles of the world, the Amazons, and so forth, um, that can go in either other direction. Um, uh, the classic world view is that you, if it's uh, due to market power, you actually do want to tax those rents, and the corporate cash flow tax does that. The other view is that if it's reward for entrepreneurship, like pharmaceuticals and so forth, then you may want to go in the opposite direction. And so we're not dealing with rents on this model. It's a very complicated topic. It can go either either direction, but it is something on the agenda to talk about. But nonetheless, um, unless adjustment costs are, are high, what happens when you just introduce expensing alone, existing capital takes a hit. And in particular, this is David Bradford's X-Tax Big Insight from the 1980s. And little math, only one equation, Tobin's Q. It, is, it shows the cost of old capital relative to new capital. When there's no expensing and no ca capital income tax, then by definition, or just no expensing at all, um, old capital and new capital have the same relative price. Uh, but when you introduce expensing, the, the value of old capital relative to new capital actually goes down. It's a wealth hit. It's actually a way, in fact, if you go to full expensing, this is David Bradford's insight, full expensing, it's a way of doing a progressive consumption tax. And, it, and it's actually fairly efficient because you're only taxing consumption and you have this wealth hit on existing uh, capital. So what happens is that when you in increase expensing, that's in a, uh, it, it stinks if you're a capital owner, but that from a tax policy perspective, that's a wealth hit. And that's in a lump sum wealth hit. Now you could push back, you know, and talk about dynamic games, investment, and say it's not, stat uh, it's not really a one-shot game, things like that. But from most, uh, for most uh, tax analysis, um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very uh, efficient uh, uh, tax. Now the problem is, is that when you lower the corporate tax rate at the same time, you're actually moving in the opposite direction. Notice that Q actually doesn't fall as much. Um, when that happens. And, so, and think about this just intuitively. Is that expensing already says new investment is not going to be taxed in present value. So when you're lowering the corporate tax rate, there's only one ca type of capital you're rewarding at that point, And that's old capital. And that's the capital that's already been installed. And so therefore, um, by lowering the corporate tax rate, you in fact are, cr are creating more debt than you otherwise would have if in fact you just kept the corporate tax rate where it was and just went to full expensing. And that actually, in fact, another way of saying it, if they had just gone to full expensing, they would have gotten more output in, in, in the model. In fact, Bradford's, uh, uh, the late David Bradford, Princeton economist, of just learned so much about tax from him over the years. His idea of the Bradford X tax, as it became known as at X coming from expensing, um, it, it, it basically, what it did is it, said, it says set expensing 100% on the uh, corporate side. In this house GOP, it's, it's basically 100% on the corporate side, but it's excluding owner-occupied housing. 
um, uh, set it to 100%, and then, then actually set the corporate tax rate to the highest marginal personal in income tax rate. He was worried mostly about tax arbitrage between the corporate and personal income tax, but it also turns out it's a uh, when you do with both of those at the same time, it's even a bigger wealth hit on existing capital. And it actually is, is a, it, it, that wealth hit translates into, in fact, lower debt, more revenue uh, over the future. Um, and so years ago, Alan Auerbach and I, his co authors, had a paper in the American Ec Economic Review looking at the Bradford X tax versus all the other approaches of flat consumption taxes and so forth. And the Bradford X tax was by far the kind of the biggest performer. So, that is kind of my main takeaways of that plan, and I look forward to your, your questions. We have signed, oh, we do have a signed <laughs> seat, okay. Excellent. <sighs> Okay, thank you, uh, to, uh, thank you to Ben and to Kent uh, for their um, uh, comments. Uh, I know there's going to be lots of questions and lots for the discussants to talk about. Let me briefly introduce our discussants. I think you probably know them both, but uh, Doug holtz -Eakin is the president of the American Action <coughs> Forum, uh, former uh, senior economic advisor to President Bush, uh, to Senator McCain and Senator McCain's 2008 campaign and director of the Congressional Budget Office. Uh, Louis Shiner is a senior fellow in economic studies at the Brookings Institution, policy director of the Hutchins Center on Fiscal and Monetary Policy at Brookings, and also had a long career uh, at, in, in government, uh, including uh, also a senior economic advisor to former President, President Clinton. Um, the first, the, right. um, so let's, let, let's start, um, I guess, with Doug. Um, Good. Sure. Thank you. Um, well, thank you for the chance to be here today, and my congratulations uh, on the first product from this effort. I, I, I want to applaud the effort. I think it's a good thing for the TPC to be doing. Um, there's a palpable sense of unease about them doing it in the papers and in the conversations, so I'm here to encourage you. Um, this, is, this is a step in the right direction. Um, I think it's important to understand, though, how to think about this. and, and I think the notion of dynamic gets, scoring gets badly misunderstood in some cases. So let me just start with a couple of comments on uh, the basic exercise. Um, scoring is not forecasting. Scoring is ranking proposals. And in the particular small world in which this is important, it's typically legislative proposals in the House and the Senate of the United States of America. And the idea is to be able to give policymakers the ability to rank them and thus make decisions about which ones are the ones they would like to, to enact into law. Um, for that reason, the most important thing about scoring is doing it the same for all the proposals. It's desirable, if at all possible, to have them be accurate, but it's more important to make sure they get ranked. And, and you'll notice that the scoring process has lots of things built into it that make sure that they're actually kind of inaccurate. For example, the CBO uh, does a January economic um, projection, and then in March, that projection is locked in stone and combined with the current law baseline projections of revenue and spending, and that becomes the, quote, scoring baseline. If there's a recession in July and you're passing legislation in August, it's still the scoring baseline. You haven't updated it. You're not forecasting. And so any, uh, uh, there's a, often a, a sort of tendency to veer off into discussions about how that's not right and that's going to be inaccurate and things that, that may be true, but remember the top, the top criteria should be to get things right or to get things ranked right. Um, for that reason, so Kent mentioned um, uh, his closure rule, you get out to 2040, there's a magic year where you just sta uh, stabilize things by cutting government spending. You're going to be making some arbitrary decisions about what the Fed does, about what, uh, how, what closes the government budget constraint, whatever it may be. The key is to be real clear about how you do it and to do it the same for everybody. Right? That, that gets, that gets uh, the fairness into this, and I, I think it's really um, important. Um, 
The second thing I'd say is um, I do not believe that there is fundamentally any real difference in the kind of uncertainty that is associated with dynamic scores versus conventional static scores. Mm -hmm. right? The static score uh, language is, is a bad language. There's an enormous amount of effort by all of the folks at CBO and JCT to incorporate everything that the, the research community has learned about the response to tax policy into their scoring efforts. Uh, the only thing that's not in there is changes in aggregate economic activity, growth, or recession. And so uh, there's this huge amount of uncertainty about those things. Um, and, and CBO is asked to score ridiculous things, and the Joint Committee is as well. Um, in, in my tenure, and any CBO director can list their favorites, you know, we had to score the budgetary impacts of terrorism risk insurance, a federal backstop against the financial consequences of a terrorist event in an unlocation, unknown location using an unknown weapon of mass destruction at an unknown year in the future. Reasonably uncertain. <laughs> uh, you know, pick, pick some others. The worst, in my view, was legislation that uh, offered a $100,000 death bonus for anyone killed in the invasion of Iraq prior to the invasion. A uh, little uncertainty there. Didn't really want to go there. Um, my point is that conventional scoring has enormous amounts of, of uh, uncertainty. And yes, there's uncertainty with the dynamic scoring. But I, I think, you know, if you're, if you're working at the JC, the CPT, JCT or the CBO, you, you are obligated to come up with a number. I mean, that's what the, your bosses are asking for, and you have to do it. The write-ups always acknowledge the uncertainty. Uh, I think uh, there should be nothing special in terms of error bars on, on high and low here versus high and low in, coming out of the micro sim. These are the same thing. And, and, and you know, I think that's worth remembering. The corollary to that is that scoring is always a judgment exercise. It is not crank up the model and get the answer. Because there is no model written in advance that contains the levers for every policy that especially the clever folks on Capitol Hill can dream up. By and large, they can dream up stuff they should never put in a model. Um, but the point is, you will always be making some judgment about the impact of policy. And the notion of getting the right model, I think, is, is a, a misplaced emphasis in, in the discussions on this. Um, you should have lots of models. I think it's great that, they're, that they've displayed things that inform uh, a dynamic score, but in the end, you're going to have to make a judgment about the impact of a policy, and that judgment can be informed by models. Models are very good at, at generating consistency, and for that reason, they're a discipline that I think should be encouraged. But I don't think um, anyone looking at the TPC should somehow be saying they've got the wrong model. That's, that's not the right question. The question is, have they come to a a, an informed judgment about the, the dynamic impacts, and can they provide a, a clear explanation for the kinds of uh, judgments that inform their decision? I, I think that's, that's what you want out of this, um, this, uh, this process. So um, among the things that I was curious about in, in sort of looking at this is um, how you handle the results. And, and this, is, this is without um, uh, judgment. I, you, know, you could, for example, have the, the, the microsim results, and then Microsim plus the Keynesian results, and then Microsim plus Kent's results, and maybe you want to add up all three, but there becomes a judgment issue about how you integrate what you've learned from these three different approaches to analyzing any single piece of tax policy. Do you concatenate them sequentially? You get the first four years, you get everything after that, or do you layer them on top of each other? Because the potential is rising in your model, there might be a near-term business cycle effect, you want them both in. Um, that, that, I think that's a, something to sort out going forward. How, how you want to think about um, sort of combining these, these results. Um, uh, second thing I really liked about uh, Ben's presentation is on the Keynesian model, he did exactly the kind of thing that I think you have to do. In, in 2017, it's our judgment that a sixth of it gets offset through the indirect stuff. In years after that, a half. Are a sixth and a half generated by God? Don't think so. You tell me? No? Nope. Okay. You have to make some judgments. And they're real clear about uh, the fact that there's going to be offsetting impacts. They're going to be bigger later. You do it the same for everybody, and, and, and you move on. I think that that's exactly the right kind of thing um, to, to focus on. Um, next questions on sort of, um, sort of methods. Really, not to pick on you, Ken. I have more questions about, about what's going on in yours. 
So if you think about the key dynamic scoring question from a, 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 a past the business cycle impacts uh, perspective, it's about two things, workers and their productivity. Are you going to get more workers and, and the hours? Uh, and um, uh, what, what are the channels for tax policy to affect productivity growth? And so the thing I couldn't discern, and it would be helpful to see, is what affects labor force participation in, in your model? So you know, given that we've got a, a, a clever little stochastic population doing all these sort of wonderful things like marrying, having kids, divorcing, and all that, how does tax policy affect the sort of aggregate labor force participation? Because that's the key thing from the point of view of a, a macro uh, uh, you know, sort of analysis. And do you get anything on the intensity margin hours? I, I can't tell. Mm -hmm. right? But that, that's sort of point number one. How many more workers and hours are you going to get? Number two, what are the channels by which productivity can be affected? Clearly, capital deepening is at the heart of this. But is there also cha a channel by which uh, total factor productivity could be enhanced. Is there you know, anything that looks like an embodiment of technological progress or anything like that? Those are the kinds of things that, you know, we only know there's a couple ways for this to happen in the end. It would be nice to see how they play out in your model, uh, in addition to the, sort of the, the, um, uh, the, the uh, capital flows, which I think uh, merits something. Um, then sort of the, my last big um, sort of t two other um, methodological things are, what do you do with the distributional analysis, right? The, it seems to me that in the interest of symmetry, what you'd want to do is take the dynamic results and then look at the distribution post-policy as well, not just pre-policy. I don't know how hard that's going to be. You have a lot of distributional capability and heterogeneity. I, I don't know how easily that maps back to the TPC's microSIM, but th that, that would be genuinely valuable. And remember, the reason to do this is to provide policymakers with more information. A simple piece of information is, given two static scores, they're both revenue neutral, one causes the economy to grow, one causes it to shrink. That's what dynamic scoring tells you. It's good information for policymakers to have. There may be some distributional insights, particularly with this plan, right? If we've got uh, a, a move to expensing and you've got a, a component in there that's a very progressive one-time tax on old wealth, the distribution tables aren't showing that. And, and that would be useful information for policymakers to actually understand that that's what they're up to. Um, and, and I think that'd be good. And then the, one more footnote as to why you might want to do the overlapping generations. It's not just the impact of tax policy on that, that might be phased in or happening in the future. There should be a big difference between temporary and permanent policies. And you can capture that with a forward-looking model in a way that you just can't with the Keynesian models. And so I think there's, there's virtue for doing that. Um, so that, which brings me to my, my brief comments on, on the, the, the scoring of the house plan, which I will not even pretend to have uh, mastered in any way, uh, given the time frames. And, but the no, first thing which I'll just get on the table and, and we can put aside, because I know that TPC already knows about this, is the treatment of the ACA taxes in this is fundamentally unfair. Um, the way the, the house task forces did their business is the health care task force, which went first, repealed the ACA, including the taxes, and the premium tax credits, that was all gone. So the baseline against which the, the, the House Tax Reform Task Force was working had no ACA taxes in it. That's a big chunk of the static revenue loss here. I don't think it's, it's fair uh, to do it that way. If you're going to do it that way, you have to at least also acknowledge that there are premium tax credits that are repealed as well and do both of them. But to just cherry pick the ACA revenue raisers and say they're repealing those gives a misleading uh, I think, guide to the size of the tax impact on, in a static sense. That's sort of number one. Uh, number two, um, I, I couldn't figure out if uh, in the Keynesian dynamics you, you singled out the sort of the, the consumption effects, the investment effects. I get that. Did you think at all about the impact on the, the, the international sector, sort of net export movements? Because there are a lot of moving pieces in this house plan on it with a, a border adjustable cash flow tax and there's going to be big exchange rate movements that come out of uh, any adoption of this. And I just didn't know if you, you, you considered that at all. So the, some of the international aspects are, are included in the indirect effects, but I did not change those indirect effects based on the, on the policy. So uh, in terms of the particular policy analysis, no. Okay. And then for you, Ken, you seem to say, and I'm just not sure I, under, I heard it right, that the baseline that you use has a territorial tax in it. But... Mm -hmm. And the corporate. 
on the corporate side, but, yeah. but we don't have a territorial tax. Yeah. yeah. So that seems wrong. No. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I'll explain. Okay. Yeah. Why don't you do that now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so what do you believe, if it finally comes down to the question of what do you believe is equalized after a policy change, is it after tax returns or pre-tax returns? And uh, the uh, equalization of after-tax returns, yeah, you could say that that is, uh, it means that foreign c corporate side is being taxed in the United States. It's true dividends and capital gains is not being taxed in the United States, but for capital flows, we are equalizing the after-tax returns. And that actually gives the most robust uh, international capital flows. Okay. So I, I, I'm not smart enough to do this on on this stage or even between last night and, and today, but there are some very, I think, important and complicated issues that, that, that come out of the, the sort of, uh, this, this sort of uh, constellation of issues. Number one, um, there's the issue of whether what you're getting in part with your net capital inflows, given the way you structured it, is in fact the repatriation of U.S. firms' money abroad to come in post-reform, which should be taxed differently and is taxed differently in the plan, and I don't know quite how to, wh where that fits in this. So that's sort of issue number one that I worry about. The second is, in a world where there are rents and, 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 and in, in a, a lot of circumstances, averages matter for locational decisions, uh, marginals matter for intensity of capital decisions, and so cutting the corporate rate affects the average, mm -hmm. and it affects uh, financial decisions. Um, so. It doesn't look like there's any room for financial decisions. So, for example, there's there's nothing about the the notion that we finally get to a point where you can't deduct net interest, and we don't have negative tax rates on some capital. There's only one kind of capital here, so that, that there's no benefit to that in the modeling anywhere. I don't think. But location decisions do matter, and, that, and I, that'd be worth thinking a little bit about. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so those are. I mean, this is all really hard, and I, I just want to say, you know, the best example of my my admonition that. Um, you shouldn't get upset with uh, getting the model exactly right. It's always hard. You should admire efforts. Uh, but you do the same thing for everyone. It's the 40% rule. That is 1,000% wrong, but I applaud you for picking a number. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, before we turn to Louise, actually, D Doug, uh, or Kent, Doug had asked you a couple of questions about effects of tax policy on labor force participation and productivity. Yeah. Did you want to respond to that? Yeah, so we actually are showing um, labor hours on the website, if, uh, if we could have pulled it up. And it's a uh, composition of the, what we get from a very rich micro simulation framework, um, which is actually tracking 60 some population subgroups that are assigned attributes, education, labor force participation, even uh, documented, undocumented. Um, even uh, education of their kids and, and so forth. So it's a very rich micro simulation framework. And then we put the deltas on top of that from the, the OLG model. So you actually do get this endogenous effect on, on labor hours um, in particular, and especially with a fixed cost of participating in the, uh, in, in the model, you can also get a, both uh, extensive and intensive margin difference. I think it would be really valuable just to show that to people. Yeah, 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 absolutely. In terms of TFP, uh, you're absolutely right. This is the standard neoclassical growth model. There's no endogenous growth. Lots of controversy how to do that, but I very much agree that um, that's something that we should uh, uh, be, be, be thinking about. But f rather quickly, uh, also the distributional uh, results that you mentioned. Um, so they actually do have a macro impact on our model because of these borrowing constraint. Uh, a fair amount of people are acting Keynesian-like. They're, they're consuming almost everything that you give them because they're, they're borrowing constraint. We, it is true we're not showing distributional analysis yet, but we have a very rich distributional analysis that we'll be exposing. Our philosophical reason for not doing it yet is because we think it's a little unfair to just show distributional analysis in the short run, which is what's typically done. We want to show it both intragenerationally as well as intergenerationally. We want to see what's the impact um, over time a a a as, as well. And so we'll, that, that's definitely on our to-do list to, 
um, uh, 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 start looking at that. And I have comments on some other things, but I think those are the ones that you wanted me I to could just, you know, probe. You know, yeah. with, with my government bureaucrat hat on, I mean, yeah. my, my point is that um, the, you know, the currency of the land is the 10-year budget yeah. window, and it'd be interesting to see what a distributional table looked like pre and post, in the same way yeah. that the revenue table looks different pre and post. That I agree, and I agree. And it's no, no deeper than that. I agree. I, the one thing I would push back, though, and is I don't, I don't want to limit just to 10 years. I think it's fair to show. Choice. You work yeah. for the Congress. Yeah. You just go, yeah, it's over. I, <laughs> part of our mission is to change the 10-year rule. We think that that's getting that into <laughs> some just, problems. In, in terms of, of the TPC performing its valuable function of being something outside the, the government that informs people about the kinds of things the government's considering with the same kind of information the policymakers have, you know, I think that 10-year presentation is important. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and, and just to, to sort of, this, this is a good example, this is where I got confused about how you use the different models, because you have Keynesian effects, he has Keynesian effects. I'm pretty sure you don't want to just add them, so I wasn't yeah. sure how this was going to work yeah, out over yeah. the long term. Yeah. Let's, let's let Louise jump in, and then we can sort of keep this Yeah, up. so actually, thank you so much. Thanks for being here. Um, glad to participate. And, uh, you know, I wrote all these notes. It was all about uncertainty. Um, and so first I want to push back about, again, um, your view on how to think about both, both on uncertainty and uh, whether or not the model matters, okay? I mean, obviously, what we're trying to do with ranking policies is get the right answers of what's best for the economy, and the model matters, right? You would agree. You're, you're pushing back against aspects of the model you think aren't going to quite capture the right tax effects. And so, so the model matters, and, and, and any given model will have different impacts on different proposals. So just because you choose the same model for six proposals doesn't mean that you're sort of fairly comparing them, right? I'm so one, actually right? arguing you shouldn't so pick a model. You should run lots of models and make a judgment. That's good. what you I end you up should, doing. That's okay. I'm with you on that. That you should run lots of models, but I do also think that you have to think about which models to believe, which not. And you want to think of which are the best models. And the other question is, what do we do about uncertainty? And I actually think this is something I think about all the time, and I don't even know the answer to it because you're saying we should be ranking proposals. So if I'm going to rank proposals and I have some very good information that says one is better than two is better than three, and then some information that says I don't really know, it's a huge band, but the mean says that three is actually better than one, right? It could be way worse, it could be much better. How much should that matter in terms of the ranking? Should I say I'm going to rank based on good information and then I'm going to downweight things that I have less confidence about? I'm not really sure about how to think about that. Um, for example, one of the reasons CBO used to do 75-year estimates, it stopped doing 75-year estimates. Not because it doesn't matter, right? If we're going to do something that's going to affect the economy in 60 years, we should want to know about it. But because at some point it became, there was just so much uncertainty that we don't feel this is useful information. On the other hand... By that argument, we should so, do the 10-year window. Pardon? I mean... <laughs> well, there's the 10-year too. Of course. I mean, but I think, you know, this is the thing. There's two as aspects of what TPC is doing. One of them, which you said, is what they're trying to do is to be like a CBO and a JCT, uh, you know, and do it faster and tell people this is what they're going to do. That's very different than saying we just want lots of different models to try to get the right answer. You know, so on one thing, what they want to do is copy the JCT model so that they can say, hey, when you get your proposal scored dynamically by JCT, this is what they're going to give you. Academically, and thinking about, con you know, contributing to what we don't really know which model, they really want to do a separate model. Maybe they want to do three separate models, um, not just JCTs. So the 10-year score, and you have to do it, you have to do it to, to mimic JCT, but then the question is, what do we do to try to get policy right? And that's a, a different question. And yeah, let, me, let me just say something about that. I agree with that. At, at the but long the, term. The title says dynamic yeah. scoring, and scoring is a very particular activity. There's lots of dynamic policy analysis. There's not lots of modeling analysis. Scoring is different. Fine. So then there is a question. I mean, I'm going to be skeptical about dynamic scoring for exactly the reason I just said, which is that I don't think the ranking should necessarily be affected a lot by things in which we, one, know very little, and two, have very wide disagreement. So what happens then is that this, the score becomes so much a function of what the scorer chooses and decides, because there really is a very, very wide range. There's different models. You can get really radically different dynamic scores. Um, let me go back to this uncertainty. Different question. than terrorism risk insurance. I think that it's different in degree. All right. I think for most, not for everything. There's some things where you know what they have no idea, right? And they have to write a number down, so they write a number down. You know, is that helpful or not? I don't know. They have to do it. Um, uh, 
But there are other um, situations where I think, in most, of them, most cases, I think, the, the static score, you know, there's always assumptions about behavior, but it's a little bit more of an accounting exercise. There's a little bit more agreement. We all know what the data are. We know what the changes in taxes are. And I think there's a lot more agreement about the static score. We can all, I don't think any of us would want them not to publish the static score, for example. Because you kind of want to start there. And then you're kind of going to know, depending on how big your elasticities are or what you're assuming about foreign investment, where you can go with it. But we're all going to sort of start with that static score and sort of get agreement. So I just think there's more agreement on the static score. I think there's less judgment. There's always judgment. But I think there's degrees. I think there's a lot less judgment. And so let me just think about, so let me talk about um, the models. So one of the reasons I'm very skeptic um, of a lot of the models is that I come from the Fed. I have come from a macro background. Um, and I know that we're terrible at doing this stuff. It's a great model. It's got wonderful internal consistency. It's, it's, you know, and it's incredibly sophisticated. And it's wonderful that you can model these different taxes. Um, but it's also true if you think about the big questions in macro um, and our models and our optimization. We don't understand why productivity growth has slowed so much. We don't understand why labor force participation has slowed so much. We don't understand why interest rates have fallen so much. Um, we don't understand why firms aren't investing now while interest rates are so low. So this idea that somehow we're going to change the tax and somehow we know that they're all going to sort of respond by a surge in investment, I don't believe we know that because we don't understand current behavior. So I think that just makes me very skeptical that a model is shedding a lot of light, um, especially as you go out 10, 20, 30 years. I just think it's a little hard to know what do you do when there's just a lot of noise. And what I was going to say uh, before was the other Alan Auerbach has a view, which seems right too, <laughs> which is that um, if you're risk averse, right, then uncertainty shouldn't make you care less about something. It should make you care more about it. So that maybe you should do like infinite things and you're very risk averse. So we want to make sure that we look at what, you know, uh, the terrible thing that can happen. But that's another way of, say, of looking at these things, which is to say, let's look at the band and let's decide you know, how we think about the worst outcomes and perhaps put weight on those. You know, we have to sort of think about how to deal with uncertainty and how it affects, um, you know, how do we feel about the bad outcome? How do we feel about the good outcome? What weight should we put on? As opposed to just saying, yes, there's uncertainty, but we're always just going to use means, right? Means, and, and that uncertainty doesn't affect our decision rule at all. So I just think, I don't, I don't know the answer to this, but I think it's a really, it's a big question that we face all the time in policy, which is how do you make decision rules under uncertainty and how much should uncertainty matter? Um, if I just want to go through, I'm not, I've said a lot of what I was going to say. Um, oh, another thing I want to say, though, is people talk about dynamic scoring. And, and obviously, in theory, we should be doing dynamic scoring. They often go right to tax. Okay? I think that's a problem. I think there's a lot of things that the government does, a lot of things that the government does, on the spending side that can have long-term growth effects that might have distributional effects some of us would like better. Um, I think. Uh, it's spending on infrastructure, it's spending on education, it's spending on more things than that too. Improved transportation can affect the labor market. Affordable housing can affect the labor market. Improved access to health insurance can affect people's health and whether or not they work or whether or not they retire. So I think then you talk about use the same model that when we're comparing policy, and one's a spending policy and one's a tax policy, we want to be sure that we think about the, what the government is doing with that money and whether or not that also can have effects on growth. Um, so like Kent, I saw that you have this government outlays that you can uh, move up and down, which I presume has no effect on GDP growth except for through the deficit, mm -hmm. as opposed to, well, what is it you're cutting, mm -hmm. and what are the effects of those things, and shouldn't we be modeling that as well? Um, so uh, uh, I think I've basically, you know, okay. So Liz, let me just ask you, where, w w so where do you land if there is all this uncertainty with, with dynamic scoring? Should we not do it? Is so it I think that we have to do it. I'm really glad TPC is doing it because other people are doing it, right? So you don't want to say, well, there are other people who are doing it, and therefore the, the only answer will be theirs, and so they may have you know, estimates that you think are way too large, and then you just let them have it because everybody can say, oh, well, your estimates are static. You don't have you know, dynamic scoring in there. If you did, it would be completely different. So I think it makes sense to do it because other people are doing it. Now, at the Fed, we used to do this all the time. We would do all these very complicated analyses that we really, the answer was we don't really know. But if we didn't do them, we couldn't say, when these outsiders come in and say the answer is, oh, it's going to be you know, 10%, and we're like, no. Like, a reasonable estimate is minus 1 to plus 1. It's still not 10, right? So I think by putting bounds uh, on what 
reasonable can be, I think that's a public service. I think because other people are doing it, you need to do it too. You know, would I prefer a world where no one was doing it as part of a score? Maybe. Do I think the analysis should happen? Of course. We are constantly trying to improve our models. We're trying to understand things. You know, you're improving the modeling. I think that's very helpful. But that's the academic perspective, which is we should have lots of different models. And the other thing is we should, one of the things that, that we can't do, we don't do, but we have to remember is that we don't ever really test our models, right? We can test a parameter. We can say, oh, we have a new paper that looks at expensing and expensing affected investment. But we can't really, we don't really ever try to really say, you know, we did this, this policy proposal and we said it would raise revenues 3%, but dynamically it would add another, you know, 2%. Uh, were we right, right? It's very difficult to do that. But the fact that it's very difficult to do that means that our models are still, they're still a belief, right? We believe this makes sense. Um, we calibrate, right? So what does that mean? Or we put in factors. So we know that if you just run a complete optimizing model where households are perfect and they're making all their decisions and there's no liquidity constraints, you know, we get things that are unrealistic. So we put in factors to make it more realistic and we try to make realistic factors. So for example, to get the labor force participation by education, you put in a fixed cost of work, right? So we put these things in and we try to match current data, right? But we don't really know if what we put in is correct. And if what we put in isn't really the correct sort of fudge factor, adjustment cost, fixed cost, then when we change a policy, we'll, we'll get it wrong still. So uh, I think that you know, ac academics need to keep doing this stuff and we need to look at it and we need to see if we can test or see if we can think about ways to know, can we compare models? Can we figure out which model is better than another? Um, uh, but on scoring, you know, I think that the static is really important. I think we should all you know, look at the st static. And then I think that the dynamic score is almost more in the, in the nature of, you know, the pros and cons for a policy, right? We're going to want to know, well, this policy we think is more likely to have good growth effects. It might have bad distributional effects. It might have good, you know, good distributional effects. But it's just another sort of, you know, lit pro or, or pro or con in the list, I think. i um, not sure how much it should be used to, you know, put the thumb on the scale when we're doing the ranking. Uh, Kent and Ben, I'd like to hear your comments on all of this. Um, sure. Uh, so I try to merge some of the, the points because I agree, I agree with uh, a lot of them. As I, I like to say, the one thing we're absolutely sh I'm sure about is that every model and every set of primary assumptions is wrong. I mean, and so I think it's, uh, it's still always a work in progress. One of the reasons our UI, if you go onto our website, budgetmodel.wharton.upen.edu, <laughs> is that we, we try not to lock down on, on some of these key assumptions. We allow the user to change it. You can try up to 256 different uh, scenarios, and you could create your confidence intervals and see, you know, what do I believe in terms of, so Doug says 40% is absolutely wrong. Okay, you can put on 100%, and, you know, you can decide that. I also agree uh, very much that dynamic scoring should not just be on the tax side. We actually re released uh, Social Security and Immigration first, partly for that reason. We're doing that dynamic scoring, if you will, on, on those programs as well. Because I, I, I agree that the discussion is kind of loaded on, on taxes. Um, we also f strongly agree on the back testing exercise. Uh, we actually spend more time validation than we do coding. And so our micro simulation model, which has this rich heterogeneity in types of households, marital status, education status, we actually go back in time and then see how would have the model uh, worked on kind of an out of sample-ish way. And we, ha we have those results on our website, on our about page, on, on our, uh, a stat our static model, then our dynamic model. One last point I just cannot resist. So I was one of the writers of the legislation, the Terrorism Risk and Insurance Act, and <laughs> Korea. In fact, how the hundred billion dollar, I know, you're like, darn it. I remember that, so the, how the hundred billion dollar cap on government um, outlays was decided as I was I literally calling back up people at Wharton School um, just to try to give me some insight. and. One guy wasn't there, I got another guy, I said, give, give, give me numbers, legislation's hot, it's going to the president's desk. He said, $100 billion sounds reasonable. And I said, all right, that's, that's it. <laughs> and that's, that's in the law today. <laughs> I mean, that's your, your tax dollars hard at work there. But I remember thinking at the time, chuckling, I wonder how CBO is going to score this thing. <laughs> Happy to amuse you guys. <laughs>
Ben, any thoughts? So, on this? so I'd say um, I agree with the importance of the spending, uh, analyzing the spending side as well. We are the tax policy center, so you know we have the machinery that we have as for analyzing taxes. You know, uh, going forward, there are lots of uh, really smart, well-informed people at the Urban Institute who know things about the spending side, and and that. You know that would be something that would be great to try and integrate more macro analysis into those things too, uh, kind of for our enterprise at the tax policy center. It's just kind of necessarily more concentrated on taxes, I think. Um, uh, as to as to the uncertainty, so I think I'm 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 a little bit as I said in my introductory remarks, I'm a little bit more on Doug's side here, and. I think I, I, maybe I'm free to say now, one of the things that used to bug me at CBO was that everything we did on the macro side, we had to justify, we had citations, we had papers explaining exactly what we did. But the people who did cost estimates, they would just kind of come out and there was a dollar number. <laughs> um, and so. That's your complaint. <laughs> yeah. I think do that. <laughs> so, so I do think that I, I kind of agree that you know some of the uncertainty uh, in conventional analysis kind of gets hidden, and there's a lot of judgment that goes into it, um, and certainly there's a, necessarily a lot of judgment that goes into the macro analysis. Um, I'm not sure it's a different order of magnitude, um, but you know. A different people would argue. I'd like to ask each of you about presentation in the, in the face of this uncertainty. So I'm sitting here looking at the analysis that, that everyone did, and it says here from 2027 20, to 2036, the revenue effect of uh, doing, a, doing a traditional analysis of the House Republican plan is $2.225.6 trillion. <laughs> And the, uh, the uh, using Kent's model, it's $1.944.1 trillion. So, I mean, the model spits out a number, and that's the number. But how do we reflect to a lay audience, to journalists, to politicians, to other people, this sense of uncertainty? Mm -hmm. do, you, do you still want to use a number? Because that's what they're all going to demand, right? They, they want to know the exact number. But, but how do we do it? Have, have you all thought about this? And got <laughs> Uh. <laughs> I mean, so I think it comes down to the question, I mean, so I don't have an answer, but I think it comes down to the question again, what do we expect them to do with the uncertainty also, right? So if, if the answer is you don't pay attention to it in your decision rule, then in some sense it doesn't really matter. We're saying this is our best guess and only pay attention to the mean, then why does it matter? I think we all feel uncomfortable with that. But the question is why? What, how do, when something is uncertain, how do we think policy should react, right? One thing that, that like CBO sometimes does this, I don't know if anybody who uses the CBO things, is that they won't show that. They'll go 1,900, right? To not give undue precisions, which you go into their spreadsheet and anybody who's using it and then tries to use the data, it makes you crazy because you can't match it exactly and you get these jagged you know, growth rates and stuff and that doesn't seem like the right way to do it, right? To basically hide the number that they have in their own spreadsheet so that they're not pretending it's more uncertain. Um, whether or not it should be always doing bands or, or or, you know, we did this uh, at, at the Hutchinson Center, we did something on uncertainty, and we had somebody from the UK come in. And there, they actually have rankings. So that they have to come up with policies, and they have, I can't remember what it was, like yellow, red, green, but for, for when they would score something, and they would say, this we're scoring with a high degree of certainty, and we'll give it a yellow. And this we're scoring with much less uh, certainty, and we're gonna give it colors. And that was a way of, without going to the numbers or to you know, butterfly charts that get larger as you expand out, to just give you know, a qualitative assessment of things that they were sure of and things that they really didn't know so much. Uh, yeah, how do you think about that presentation? Yeah, I mean, uh, we're always kind of asked for, give me the number, that's what's easiest. And I agree, that's just been completely uh, wrong. Social Security in the past have, has done high, medium, and low kind of assessments. The, prob the criticism with that traditionally was that they would it, it set everything at kind of the pessimistic or the most optimistic uh, assumptions. And a lot of those assumptions were not mutually compatible with each other. So a process kind of known as stochastic analysis has been, uh, was uh, evolved there, was uh, involved in that um, uh, work. And I think um, 
you know, fundamentally, uh, it's from our perspective, we are, are tr make a best guess on what we call default settings, but we really encourage people to start thinking about changing those, playing with different parameter settings, and because you may be wor worried about the worst case scenario. You might want to say, suppose we're wrong, because we absolutely are wrong, what's the worst case scenario? Uh, one last point is that uh, a big uh, issue that we're tackling, in fact, we're uh, a whole side project on this, is also how to get um, larger macro shocks into uh, the models. In particular, if you look at the CBO forecast, it's um, basically recession free, and we know, you know so much of the debt buildup in the last several years has been because of response to the recession. Our, our projections should be inclusive of these types of shocks that can happen. So when we start to think about uncertainty, we should be able to run scenarios. Suppose this happens. Um, uh, this is what investment managers do. I have a portfolio. Suppose, you know, markets tank. How robust is my portfolio? We should be able to run those type of simulations um, to talk about robustness. Ben, have you thought about so this presentation? I, I mean, yeah, it's something we struggled with at CBO uh, uh, continually and, and never, I mean, uh, totally satisfactorily solved, I don't think. Um, one thing that I will throw out uh, is that many times you're very uncertain even about the degree of uncertainty. So, for example, think of two different uh, things. Think of something where there's a whole lot of academic research but the results are all over the map. So then you know you're uncertain. Sometimes you're going to have to make decisions about something where there is no research. That's In which case are you more uncertain? Like, uh, and how do you even put a bound on it when basically <laughs> you don't so, have... So can I piggyback you on don't that? Have, sure. yeah. I think it's a really important point. And, and again, one of the reasons I have encouraged everybody to, to do this activity called dynamic scoring is not because I think it's going to change the world. It, it, it applies in a tiny fraction of pieces of legislation that are actually significant. It should be done symmetrically, all that. But by doing it, people will now get interested in the questions they didn't know anything about when they had to do it. And it has a, a, a beneficial self-reinforcing focusing of the research on the things you need to understand yeah, intertemporal true. inefficiencies and growth impacts. Great. Yeah, that's an important point. I'll, let me tell you the, what, the thing I think we know nothing about, that we should know a lot about, and that is the relationship of taxes on entrepreneurship. I mean, if you look at 1980, um, and you look at the S&P 500 today, versus which accounts for 70, 80% 80, 80 of all listed value in the United States, um, and you look at, at S&P 500 companies today, majority of them were not in the S&P 500 in 1980. A tremendous amount of wealth is generated in the United States from entrepreneurship. It's also the main driver of inequality at the very high end, according to uh, Emmanuel Saez's work. The fact of the matter is we know very little about that relationship between taxes and entrepreneurship. And, w and that's something that we really need to figure out. Glad to hear you say that because I know TPC is doing some work in that area. So yeah. that's great. So on the presentation, I mean, you know, Ben knows very well. CBO has struggled with this and at times um, basically used to present the budget outlook with, with the, the sort of computed, you know, 95% confidence range around it. And um, I got yelled at for doing that um, because, you know, it suggested we knew nothing. <laughs> the bound, the, there, were two, conclusion, by the way. there were two problems. One was that the bounds were so wide that people yeah. said that they, they were meaningless. And the second was that sometimes we had outcomes of then we're out outside, outside of them, yes. Because <laughs> 100% of the problem the distribution wasn't there. Yeah, I know. Um, right. Anyway, um, but, but there's, there's a, I think, a, a very important and subtle distinction between the way you think about this inside the government and the way you think about it outside. So inside the government, I, I have very strong views about this, which is that you work for the decision maker. You are not the decision maker. And so um, the, the worst thing staff can do in Washington, broadly defined, and I've seen it, is try to get a presentation cooked up to get their principal to do what they want. That's like horrible and um, a firing offense in my view. So the question becomes, what does my principal want in the way of information to make decisions? And I might really detest what they want. Like when we were talking about social security reform, they did not want to know what the second moment 
mm -hmm. the outcomes on, on individual requirement uh, in the individual retirement accounts work. But mm. that, that was uninteresting to them, and they kept telling me to leave it out. Mm. Now, that's frustrating since it's all about risk. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, so, th but outside of the government, where, you know, you, you, this is uh, an even harder question because you've got lots of people are going to want to come to the site. They're going to have their idea of what is good public policy based on a decision rule that they bring to it. So a lot of people are very risk averse, others not. And so I, I think. Given that there are lots of different kinds of uncertainty, you want to have two layers of presentation. I think one layer of presentation is to, to actually explain to people the kinds of, of uh, models you're using and their strengths and weaknesses so they understand it. People don't really understand modeling. They think it's the real world. It's not. You know, I always tell the people, okay, suppose I have a model of, a, of an airplane, which is one of those plastic models. It's got decals and painted and looks just like an airplane. And then I got a balsa wood glider. Which is the best model? Well. Let's see which one flies. If you're modeling looking like an airplane, this one's great, but it won't fly. But the balsa one will. Models are built with a purpose. So an OG model is great for life cycle savings decisions, some labor supply stuff. But it, by definition, has imperfect foresight. This is an even shorter horizon, less. Informing them about the kinds of things that will get missed is, is one thing. Then there's the whole just, look, these parameters are uncertain. And then there's the, what's the, the, the distribution of, of outcomes? What's the 95% outcome range look like, given what we know about those things? But you, you're not going to be able to have a single presentation that solves it. You just won't. Sorry, sorry to say that. No, no, I, I, <laughs> I'm not surprised. Um, I think we've got some time. In fact, we have quite a bit of time for questions from you all. Um, let me uh, make a couple of requests. First of all, if you're watching us online, send e email questions to us at events at urban.org. Uh, if you're in the audience, two requests, please, actually three. Uh, one of them is wait for a microphone. Second, tell us who you are. And third, I know people feel very strongly about this, but please don't make a speech. The only people who got to make speeches this morning were Ben and Kent. Um, uh, and um, I tried. <laughs> uh, Jim. Yes. Jim. Hold on. Wait, wait for the mic. <laughs> Remember instruction number one. <laughs> Uh, Jim Klumpner, I used to work for both the House and Senate Budget Committees. Uh, and I want to ask you, the panel, to go back to making a strict distinction between scoring and analysis. Because the next time you have one of these sessions, you shouldn't use the word scoring in the title. Because most of what has been discussed is you know, an array of models and red light, green light, yellow light, that sort of thing. But budget scores have a very specific purpose in the government's budget process, and they have to, at least under current law, take specific values. So my question is this. You have to make judgment calls in the judgment of each of the members of the panel. Do you think that incorporating dynamic macroeconomic effects in official budget scores Will increase or decrease the reliability of those scores? Will it increase signal or will it increase noise? I think I, I've made myself clear, which I think it probably yeah. will increase noise. I mean, I think I agree with <laughs> Doug and Ellen Arbach's point. I mean, zero cannot be right the right answer. We all kind of agree that zero is not the right answer. And so then the question is, is that, I mean, you could imagine where different assumptions give you different actual directions. One assumption gives you a positive, another one gives you a negative, and then you say, we don't know, so we'll just call it um, a, a zero. Um, but a precautionary saver, this is Alan's point, is w they want to think about risk, and not only t the top of risk, the third moment, you mentioned the second moment, so I had a one up here. The third moment, um, they, they also care about, um, you know, uh, precautionary kind of uh, 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 savings. And so what that would seem to suggest is that you do a range of estimates and you place a little bit more weight on bad scenarios. Um, that's what, how you and I as investors, you know, think about this. We, 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 we think about in our portfolios, we should be thinking about not just the expected outcome, but we place higher marginal utility on kind of worse scenarios. And that's true with any type of risk where even with taxpayers, where they're, they're the residual. They're the ones who either in form of benefit cuts or tax increases, they're the residual. And the same argument applies there. So 
I think it's about a range of estimates. I think it's about looking for more robust policies, but not just you know assuming uh, 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 like a hundred percent certainty that zero is the right answer. I think so. Yeah, I, mean, I would still show static and I would show dynamic, and um, but yeah. So I'd ask. I mean, I think the easy answer is it increases both the signal and the noise. Uh, I would think about the question. Well, should these um, scores include behavioral, any behavioral responses? I mean, those are uncertain, for sure. They're adding noise because we don't know exactly how uh, uh, people are going to respond in their reporting behavior or their consumption behavior or what goods they're buying. Uh, so yeah, there's uncertainty around those estimates and necessarily that kind of uh, in increases the, the error band or something in the estimate. but. I, I don't think very many people would argue that you shouldn't have those in. And, and I guess my feeling is that, that the adding the macro in isn't all that much different, like I argued before. Yeah, I mean, I think we're also taking a little bit too dismal of a view for the, the science of economics here. Let me give you an example where for, for, for a fairly long time, we often thought the consumption data or how much people were saving for retirement, people were under saving. Until we started to build more sophisticated models of paper in the general uh, political economy some years ago with John Carl Schultz and co-authors actually showed once you start to embed things like Social Security and other types of insurance programs and things like that, it actually turns out 80% of the households are actually saving kind of adequately and the other 20% may be kind of present bias type things. The point is, is that as we build more sophisticated models, I'm actually not convinced that all is unknown. I think we, we are getting better at this, um, at, at modeling things. And I would just take off from that. Um, so there are two additional elements. I, you know, I've worked with a lot of people who are doing this, the macro work at, at JCT, CBO, and I think they do a very careful job. Mm -hmm. um, and so that gives me confidence. But also, I think the more outside places are doing macro analysis, then that's kind of a useful check. And, and as we go forward, you know, there, maybe there can be more and more of a consensus <laughs> about those type of effects in the same way that there seems to be more consensus or at least less controversy about the behavioral uh, responses that are. 20 years ago, we thought weather forecasting could never work. <laughs> <laughs> We've gotten better at it. Uh, uh, Bob. Uh, you're fine. Wait for Mike. Hang on just a second. Mike is coming. There you go. I'm Bob Posen. I teach at MIT and on the advisory board here. Uh, I'd like to just try to help us understand how different Ben and Kent's models will work. If we take sort of popular ideas like let's uh, increase the earned income credit or let's increase the rate on dividends. I'm, I'm trying to figure out how your different analysis would really, what would be the key points of difference mm -hmm. in the way your models would work in analyzing those two uh, proposals? Well, I, can, I, can, I can take a first stab. I mean, I think that, you know, uh, really my model, like I said, is only analyzing one piece, and so it's missing a lot. For the earned income tax credit, all my model would care about is how many dollars of after tax income people are receiving. And the earned income tax credit has a, a, a lot of other effects, uh, giving people an incentive to enter the labor force, but then it's phased out, so it increases effective marginal tax rates. That's the kind of stuff that Kent's model is taking into account. We, we really want to have a more integrated view, and uh, Doug was, was talking about that. Um, it's something that we're, we're working towards, we're in the process of doing, but uh, uh, we're not there yet. Yeah. And as, as Ben pointed out, so in our model, you would see some households encouraged to work, so effectively the marginal tax rates are going down. And then some households who are in the phase out region, they're actually facing a higher marginal tax rate. What we actually see in the data is it's rather surprisingly, empirically, households seem to be optimizing pretty well on the EITC. In fact, where we see kink points, we see a lot of bunching um, there on, on income. And so, um, and our model would, would incorporate that kink. What about a corporate rise in the corporate dividend rate? 
Yeah. Once again, so I would hit mainly high income households, so you'd have less of a response, but my model would essentially be based on the, on the impact on after tax income. Uh, you'd have less of a response because it would be rich people yeah. getting the money. So there's the model, what we have today and what we're evolving it to, in particular today, um, we don't have on the corporate side, it, uh, it, we're assuming throughout fancy economic language of Mendigani Miller, that there's an, people are indifferent between capital and uh, equity on the corporate side. We know that's not right. We know US, how, US in fact, is heavily um, favored toward debt. And so we're actually going to uh, explicitly break that down. So in the short run, what we could do is put in effective tax rates in, on, on capital income and see the effect of that. But you're absolutely right, Bob. I mean, what you want to explicitly model, because it does matter. Uh, potentially a lot, is the uh, actual decision at the corporate side between debt and equity, and not just use Medigani Miller as the excuse. Okay, more questions. Yes, sir. Mike Bennett, Center for, Center for Fiscal Equity. Uh, question, how robust is your model, or flexible, I guess, in dealing with uh, new proposals like Michael Gratz's um, and Bruce Bartlett's and mine, uh, similar proposals, to, to have a mix, shift to a mixed VAT income tax model? Yeah, I mean, ours are, yeah, ours, are, ours are actually set up already to do that. I mean, we haven't analyzed that, but we have consumption taxes, having a sales, national sales tax or VAT, um, very straightforward. The one thing we haven't explicitly modeled is we know the difference between like a VAT and a national sales tax could, there could be evasion differences. So that's something that we'd want to uh, eventually incorporate, but it's not there yet. And for, just as a note, if you look at the house plan, it's very close to, to exactly that. It's a, a cash flow business tax that's border adjustable and looks like a VAT in very many ways mm. with uh, capital income surtaxes at the household level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Eric. Uh, so one of the uh, nice, easy things, it wasn't an easy exercise of, ex of estimating the house GOP plan, was because it was uh, inten intended to be revenue neutral, we didn't really have to worry about anything on the spending side of the budget. Uh, when you're looking at the candidates, they might have both tax changes and spending sides. If you're doing conventional analysis, you can say we just have to worry about revenue. But if you're doing um, dynamic analysis, the debt effects are going to have feedback effects which affect the revenue side as well as the spending side. So I guess my question is, how should we be thinking about presenting analyses where candidates are proposing both tax changes and spending changes in the same time if we're going to do dynamic analysis? Yeah, I mean, I can say what we did. I mean, because uh, our micro simulation model at Penn is, has uh, uh, a lot of that stuff on the outlays side, because what we needed was what we got from uh, TPC is a lot of s super useful information on the, on, the, on the tax side, including revenue estimates on a static basis and so forth. But your point is right, Eric, and, and that is we don't, uh, for our model, it's not just the delta that matters, it's the actual level of debt that matters. And so you have to get the outlay side um, in there as, as well. So I guess the answer to your question, I think you just have to explicitly model it. You need to model both sides, outlays and taxes, because that debt equation, unless you're in a small open economy, that debt e equation actually has first order effects when the, when the plan's not balanced. I, I would, so I agree, and it's something that I had worried about, about analyzing the presidential plans. Um, I think you need to be sure that the, that both sides are well specified. So as long as there's something to analyze, um, sometimes the tax <laughs> plans themselves aren't aren't fully specified. But at least you have a, a better idea of the parameters. And and um, uh, I'm not sure that's always true on the spending side. And then the other the the place where it make it really hard is if there are things on the spending side that do have incentive effects. So yeah. that's we're not. Uh, uh, set up to, to model that at the moment. That, that would be the, the, the hardest thing to deal with. So our website has a dial control on spending. You can just play, play with it. But there are yeah. two different things. You can, yeah. you can answer the question, what are the revenue and, and growth consequences of the, of the candidates' tax proposals? 
and in doing so have some sort of closure rule like Kent does to, for the budget. Or you can answer the question, what are the budgetary and economic consequences of the candidate's proposals? And do both sides of the budget constraint. Um, it, it's, the second one's just a lot more work. Uh, yes, sir. Hi, Frank Clemente, Frank Clemente, Americans for Tax Fairness. Uh, two questions. One is, uh, can you, t what's the historical record on the accuracy of static forecasting or static estimating? I'd be very interested to know that. And the other is, I don't, I don't want to put you in an awkward position, but uh, you know, the Tax uh, Foundation obviously is getting a lot of prominence for its, uh, a lot of play with its estimates. I'm just kind of curious. <laughs> Do you, would you feel comfortable, you know, giving your opinion of, of the accuracy of those based on what you folks are doing? So, so let, me, let me go first, so, because full disclosure, I'm on the board at the Tax Foundation, so everyone should know that. And, um, you know, the Tax Foundation has a model, and I think its virtue is that it has taken the same analysis of all these different proposals, and you can now rank them based on their model. Their model is a, a really transparent neoclassical growth model where certain capital accumulation policies can't lose. And this is why it's important to know what kind of models you have. And so, you know, I, I can figure out right away where something's going to end up there. I mean, that, that's, that's the state of the art uh, at the moment. Um, I, on the first question, um, I tried to tell you not to ask that question. Because the whole, the whole point of freezing the, the economy at the January forecast in the March uh, current law is to make the actual accuracy bad, but to make sure that you play fair between the initial proposal some congressman puts in in, say, June, the revised one in August, and in the case of the ACA, which went for two years, carry that thing now badly out of date for like two full years, I forget exactly what it was, so that you are not giving inconsistent guidance as to the implications of changing and tweaking the law. And that guarantees that, that it's going to be, quote, inaccurate, but I think that's the wrong question. So I, I'm not as, um, I don't have certainly all the insights other than the high level on the tax foundation. We don't criticize or critique kind of other uh, models out there. Well, we'll say is that the standard neoclassical growth model um, has this what's called Ricardian property to it. And in that framework, debt plays a lot less importance than marginal tax rates. And so what's driving a lot of results in our model is this debt competing with uh, private capital. The recording equivalence is not um, a holding. And so um, uh, th that, that turns out to be, uh, I think, a one big difference between our deltas. I mean, I th my understanding is that, that uh, the tax foundation model would be more similar to your model with the dial to 100% of, right. of open That's right. economy. That's right. So 100% open economy is going to get a lot closer to the tax foundation. Model. As far as the, the record, I think it's always very hard to go back and look because of the counterfactual. You don't know exactly what the economic conditions would have been without the tax legislation. My understanding is that, that reviewing those rev revenue estimates, you don't get you know, a systematic undercount uh, or, or over, overestimate of tax losses, say, from tax cuts. And I would say that's not necessarily because the, the static uh, estimate was right, but because those macro reflows may be relatively small, so you just, they don't really show up. Uh, but, um, but there was my, some years ago a critique of CBO analysis. This is, this is even before uh, your time, Doug where I think like Ellen Arbach to use this name, it was part of uh, looking at how well did the CBO kind of do. And what you expect was kind of noise if it was, there was kind of no bias. And he found that there was not, it wasn't noise, there was actually some bias. Sure. Um, and, I, and the interpretation I always gave of that was that um, th it was that current economic conditions, maybe we respond a little bit to too much. So the example is when we had that revenue surprise w with Clinton, um, th we called it stat at the time. And it, wasn't it wasn't really clear if that was temporary or permanent. And then, you know, uh, some of it got incorporated as it may be permanent. And so uh, it may have been kind of just an over response. So, so my memory of that yeah. is that the problem was that the people who JCT and CBO work for 
uh, really don't like change. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. They don't want the estimates to change a whole lot from year to year. And so uh, the estimates tended to change slowly in response to new information. And that gave a, a, you know, a serial correlation in the errors. Um, but um, that, could, that could be right. goes back uh, a long ways. <laughs> uh, another question. Uh, Charles. Charles Rosati, former IRS commissioner. Just one specific question for either model. I think one of the features of the House plan is that interest becomes non-deductible at the corporate level. I, I think that's right. Did you incorporate that into the models, uh, the impact on investment? Interest becomes, yeah, I mean, we got that from the TP, it's, so TPC did those cal uh, calculations on a static basis, and then we, uh, in, in terms of adjustment of effective, Two things, really three key parameters. Um, what's the expensing rate? What's the capital share? And then what's the effective tax rate on, on capital? So how much on the capital share, how much is passed through versus not? And so they incorporated that into those, those estimates. So it would have shown up primarily, I think, in the effective tax rate Effective on tax, income. right, in low on capital share. One more question, maybe, from the audience? Go ahead. I have a question for Ken that I, I meant to ask. Yeah. So what, do you, what does your path of interest rates look like in your model, and how does that match what the market expectations of interest rates yeah, look yeah, like? Yeah, yeah, it's a good And also, like, expensing, the value of expensing really, really depends on what the opportunity cost of capital is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so. so two things. One is that what we do is we take our stat, the, uh, the baseline interest rates, we get that from CBO. And so then what we do is um, uh, those are calculated on a kind of a static basis by CBO. We actually start with our open economy model and we're adjusting our government spending a, 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 a correctly to match CBO on an open economy basis in terms of de government debt and uh, uh, interest rates. But then in our closed economy model, then we let, we, uh, we've already captured how much government spending has to change and so forth to hit these targets. We let things run a little bit more hog wild. And in particular, so even the baseline can actually, you'll see more debt, uh, you'll, you'll see GDP effects in the, in the baseline. Um, and then what we're, we're reporting ultimately is then, then dynamic deltas relative to each one. So our, our, another way of saying it, in the open economy fr uh, framework, you, uh, there's no particular reason for us not to use CBO, but then because interest rates are endogenous, when you start to close the economy, they have to become endogenous. But are you saying that your baseline, you can't match CBO's baseline outlays and interest rate assumptions? You actually have to change their outlays to get, the, uh, to, to get their interest rate assumption no, generated? We, like are, lower spending? we are matching that in the open economy version mm -hmm. of it. Um, because uh, the, the as key assumption is when CBO did those calculations, they're not doing general, they're not doing dynamic analysis of those interest rates. And so then, then when we close the economy, uh, any type of closure, we allow those things to be uh, endogenous. Let me ask one last question. Um, we've been talking about this mostly in the context of policy issues. Obviously, we're in the middle of a presidential campaign. We were going to release uh, uh, analysis of the Trump and Clinton proposals. Obviously, it changed when, when Mr. Trump came up with a new plan. But, but let me ask you, what benefit is it to voters mm. for us to provide analysis of presidential campaign proposals? Mm. Doug? <laughs> Number one. <laughs> Is there any internal consistency between what the campaign is saying they'd like to accomplish and what the campaign is saying they're going to do? Mr. Trump stood up and said, I want to have more rapid growth, much more rapid growth. Here's my plan. Under, you know, maybe you just want to, under what circumstances do they line up? You know, if, if these things don't happen, if you don't control the debt, whatever it is, that, that's not going to work. Okay, so like he said, I'm going to get 25 million jobs. Okay, that's inconsistent with his apparent stance on immigration because you can't get to 25 million jobs with the people who reside in the United States right now. You just can't. So, you know, th I think that's very valuable, right? For people to, to get some consistency between the rhetoric and the, re and the, re the reality. Louise? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Um, 
uh, which is that people can't judge you know, on their own when someone is um, saying something that is reasonable and not, and it's up to you know, people like us to go and you know, try to do the analysis and then say what we find. No, I completely agree. Well, well put. Uh, thank you all very much. Thanks to Louise and Doug and Ben and Kent. Thank you all for coming.